welcome everybody to the College of Social Sciences uh, Dean Spring 2017 graduate student colloquium. Uh, it's nice to see four house here. So thank you so much for taking the time to come. So uh, without further ado, uh, first let me uh, thank uh, the Dean of our college, Boy Jacobs, for all his support and encouragement for RISCA uh, College Y and also invite him for his opening remarks. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the second annual graduate uh, student club in the College of Social Sciences. So, a big thank you to Dr. Shashir Mather, who's our associate dean of research, for organizing this year's colloquium. Uh, last year's was super excited. We have lots of great presentations, lots of good questions and answers afterwards. So, uh, be sure to stick around for that part of the end. Uh, today we have another uh, great lineup, and unfortunately, I'm not going to be around to see it. I'm actually triple booked today, so it's, it's crazy. So uh, I'm going to have to leave in a few minutes, but I'm looking forward to watching the televised uh, uh, the, the recording later. So uh, last year I was able to stay the whole thing, this year I unfortunately have to leave, but I'm very excited. And again, I want to thank everybody for coming. You know, RISCA is uh, an acronym, Research Scholarly Creative Activity. It's very important to us here in the college, so we're super excited about the next generation of, of students who are going to be the tomorrow's future professors and uh, uh, workers in many areas of industry. So very excited to hear about their research today. And uh, with that, let me turn it over to Pamela Stats, who's our Associate Vice President for the Office of Research. So she coordinates all of the university's risky activities. So we're very happy that she can be here with us today. It's truly a pleasure to be here today. Um, I actually got a, a little bit of a taste of uh, social science graduate student uh, uh, research via the anthro uh, department on Friday at the Anthrox. Am I saying that quite right? Yes. 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 It, it was truly impressive and a lot of energy and a, and a lot of good information was shared. And so um, I was really pleased that uh, Shashir uh, gave me an opportunity to come and, and both uh, be here for a little bit of a kickoff as well as uh, get the excitement of hearing about people's work. Um, I think one of the things I just wanted to address is that um, it's really impressive what uh, the college has done over a number of years of investing in the faculty and the students and that there's some very interesting combinations of people's uh, scholarship with uh, community activism and uh, social justice issues um, and all the way through uh, more uh, basic research as well. So it's a very uh, a very exciting college to be part of, as I'm sure you've experienced. And uh, I, I just look forward to hearing uh, all about the work. And it's really nice that you've not only uh, created, and this goes out to Shashir, uh, created the opportunity not only to share the work, but to also have us engage in asking questions. Um, I think one of the things that I had hoped for as a graduate student, or when I was going off for graduate school, is to join a community of scholars and what I found was that people sometimes just get isolated in their own you know, silos. And so it's really a, a, a great delight to be part of a community of scholars and to be invited to, to hear the, the progress that's being made. So thanks very much. And take it over, Shashir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so, uh, I'm standing before you as the first presenter, but I would like to provide some uh, overview of the logistics and, and the structure uh, of today's events. So we have five uh, presenters today across four different departments. Uh, and each presenter will present for 10 minutes, and then we will follow it by five minutes of discussion. So that should take us to around 150 to 120 or so. If we have maybe five or 10 minutes towards the end, uh, we can take a few more questions at that time also. Uh, and then we will have our associate dean, Ron Rogers, conclude uh, the event. So, so with that, uh, allow me to uh, introduce our first uh, presenter and give you one second. 
I need to find a piece of paper with a title. So sorry. <laughs> Here we go. The first presenter, uh, Tara Coughlin, uh, her title is uh, for presentation Environmental Fiction, A Call to Action. So join me in welcoming Shah. A little bit of synopsis of her presentation. Stories have always reached people at a deep and emotional level. They have been used for generations to deliver messages and they continue to do so today. Many storytellers have taken up arms to fight for the environment and they do this by weaving environmental themes into their creative works. These works of environmental fiction have made their way into the hearts of society, rallying people to rise up and fight to protect the planet. Tara's presentation looks at how movies and books bring our attention to the environment and how they have helped to shape our world. Here you go. Hello everyone and thank you for coming today. Um, my name is Tara, as you've heard. How many of you have ever read a book or seen a movie that changed you? Maybe when you were little, you saw Bambi as a kid and decided you wanted to become a firefighter, which is what happened to my dad. Stories shape us. They help us understand how the world works, and they show us how to live. So I will start you off with an example. Ashlyn realized that she was risking her life for the crumpled paper package. It was a package that would have seemed relatively worthless half a year before, but a lot had changed in those months. Now people would attack her to get their hands on what she carried. She glanced from side to side, checking her surroundings. It was easy to convince herself that some sort of ninja-esque figure would drop down from those rooftops and challenge her. The paper bag was starting to feel like a big meaty bone held in front of a starved dog. A pair of sunken faces peered out from the smashed doorway. Ashlyn started at the side of them and tried to avoid the eyes that followed her down the road. Not long ago, that building had served sushi and teriyaki chicken. Ashlyn had gone there with a friend once, but there was no food left anymore. Paper rustled as she shifted her arm. She considered throwing the bag across the road just to get away from it. She had not been into downtown by herself in months. She'd come a few times with her parents, but now she was on her own. A woman appeared from one of the side roads. She was tall and bony, her clothes ragged and grimy. Ashlyn knew she was in the same state, thin and dirty. It had been some time since she dared use precious water to rinse her clothes. Even her hair hung in greasy black strands to her shoulders. Her semi-dark skin was made darker by the smudges of ash and dirt across her ankles, arms, and face. As the woman drew near, Ashlyn skirted around her, keeping a good ten feet between them. The woman gave her an uneasy glance and seemed content to stay away. As the girl hurried down the road, another figure appeared ahead of her. He was a tall, dark-skinned man who walked directly toward Ashlyn. She shied away from him, edging toward the sidewalk. She scurried along like a rat moving down a gutter. Ashlyn passed the broken window of an old florist. In a flash, a hand darted through the broken glass and snatched at the package. A feral-sounding screech escaped Ashlyn's mouth. She pulled, trying to dislodge her precious parcel from the hands of the thin, wild-eyed woman, but the woman's long fingers were clenched like iron bars. A sudden jerk caught Ashlyn off balance, and she found herself pressed against the window frame. There was a flash as the woman brandished a long blade of glass. <clears throat> the glass lashed towards Ashlyn's face. She jerked her head back, and a heartbeat later, she would have let go by reflex, but something darted in front of her and struck the pale lady in the face. She reeled back in the package tour, sending a shower of beans and corn kernels to the cracked pavement. The apple bounced to the cement, its skin bruising. Ashlyn backed away, even as the woman disappeared into the darkness of the shop. The dark, scruffy-looking man had returned. He had bashed the lady in the face, saving Ashlyn from the glass. But she was not reassured by his presence. After all, he was still standing over the spilled food. He may have come to take everything for himself. Only about half of the contents remained in the torn package that Ashlyn held. At least the precious container of water was still in her possession and not broken. Probably the safest thing to do would be to retreat and leave the spilled food behind. She cast one longing glance at the bruised apple on the ground, but took another step back. Hold on, what about your food? The man's voice made her jump. He knelt and picked up the apple, then stood and held it out to her. She reached out a shaking hand and let him drop the apple into it. 
He knelt again and started scooping the beans and corn into a dry, gritty pile. When he had a handful, he held them out. Hesitating, Ashlyn approached and let him pour them back into the paper. When he finished, he stood and faced her. Stay away from corners and dark places, he cautioned. Keep in the open so you can see what's coming. He turned and walked away down the street. Ashlyn finally snapped out of her stunned silence. She uncleansed her jaw and said, thank you. The man turned and grinned at her, raising a hand before continuing on his way. Still shaken, Ashlyn hurried toward home. This is the beginning of the environmental novel I wrote for my master's program. And it takes place about 50 years in the future around the California Bay Area. And a disaster has just destroyed much of the infrastructure around the oil industry, making oil very scarce. Because society hadn't really fully prepared with uh, renewable energies, the loss of oil strikes a major blow to transportation and other services. And this leads to a shortage in electricity, food, and even water in many places. Uh, the suburbs become dangerous with people killing each other to steal batteries and food, and this is when Ashlyn's parents are killed, leaving her alone with no way to contact her friends and family. Eventually, she ends up leaving her home and heading over the mountains to the coast, where there is a organic farm where she hopes to take refuge. Humans have caused a lot of damage around the planet, and we haven't really done much to try to fix these problems. So this is where environmental literature comes in. Stories help us feel empathy towards characters, which can lead to a change in our psychology. The Monkey Wrench Gang is one of the iconic works of environmental fiction. It's the first book to be dedicated entirely to protecting the environment. It's about four people who fight to protect construction from destroying the beautiful desert they love. And it's inspired the creation of organizations like Earth First. The Lorax is another one of the environmental works, and the character of the Lorax has become one of the mascots for environmental protection. Anthropocentrism is the belief that humans are the pinnacle of existence and that everything on the planet exists solely for humans to use. This way of thinking has let humans destroy forests, hunt species to extinction, and pollute the land, sea, and sky. Basically, this way of thinking has given us the excuse to destroy the planet. So anthropomorphism is a way to increase sympathy toward non-human characters, and it means to portray an animal or anything else with human-like characteristics, physical or mental or both. And it can work wonders. When one man took his grandson to see Bambi, he left the theater and vowed that he would never hunt again. Stories that feature habitat destruction inevitably have bad guys that are cutting down trees and killing animals, so the good guys have to stop them. Although in real life it's hardly so simple, it's easy to say that you want to protect the forest, but what about the wood that went to building your house and furniture? Do you know where that came from? And from the other side, people that cut down trees aren't necessarily evil. They may have no other choice. The movie Princess Mononoke does an excellent job of making you care for both sides. Those the people that cut down trees and the people that want to protect them. Dystopias serve as a warning for what might happen if we refuse to change. They are meant to frighten us into taking action. For example, if we keep using up the resources of the world, we could end up with a planet like in Wally, -E, which is covered in mountains of trash and devoid of life. They often feature a blend of different problems, such as habitat destruction, overpopulation, or problems with technology. We don't really have full control or understanding of all our new technology, so stories urge us to think about the consequences of our creations, as well as they show us how technology separates us from the natural world. <clears throat> Overall, though, one of the simplest things you can do to draw attention to the environment is just to show how beautiful it is to encourage people to go outside and play in the mountains and forests because if people fall in love with the wilderness, they will fight to protect it. One of the, if, an, if a writer wants to encourage people to act, they need to give their audience something to fight toward. In my story, Into the Ashes, I've tried to create a world 
which serves as, as a warning for the consequences of our lifestyles, but also provides an uplifting message. So after the disaster, Ashlyn lives at the farm for a few years, and she protects the forests that surround them and protect them from the remainders of society. And when she finally returns to that society, she finds that it's begun to recover in her absence. I hope to convey the capacity for humans to rise from disaster. If something awful does happen, then we can rebuild to be better than we were before. Because ultimately, the greatest thing a writer can give is hope. We have caused a lot of damage. We can decide that we're never going to change and that things will only get worse. Or we can move forward, fix our mistakes, and show how creative, compassionate, and strong humans really can be. Thank you. Five minutes of uh, discussion time. Uh, so, if you have questions or comments, then please raise your hands, and I'll come to you. Yeah, that's one of the problems is people really don't understand how everything they do is either affects the environment or is affected by the environment. And if we don't structure our discourse early on in life for young people to come up thinking that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the important things is to get environmental education going early because I didn't see a single environmental education class until high school. And my work is a young adult fiction uh, because I hope to catch a younger audience and let them know about these problems so that when they look for work, they can take that into account if they choose. <laughs> I did a special project, okay. yes. And I'm just curious, because I, I think it's great. I, your, your writing is wonderful, and I enjoy hearing your story. So when you do when a project like that, do you actually, is the work just the piece of fiction? And then do you do that type of analysis that, you're, that you just gave right there as part of it? Or I'm just, I'm into mm -hmm. sociology and, you know, the right fiction. So I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about that. That's OK. Everything. No one. No one in my department wrote fiction either, so. <laughs> of course, yeah. Ha about half of my project was a uh, literature review, basically. So I, I broke it down by different t subjects, like I had habitat destruction and uh, dystopias. There were a lot more than that, and I discussed the works that fell into that category and how they used that, those themes to bring out the environmental problems and whether or not they were effective. And the other half was my story, which I did a lot of research to make sure that I'd get things accurate for, um, like I mentioned, the destruction of the oil infrastructure. I had to do a lot of research about that to figure out where they were and what could possibly damage them and those sorts of factors. And so, yeah, I had a team of scientists telling me where I needed to do more work to make my work more logical and accurate and such. <laughs> Like thinking how you might um, present this to 
um, a panel at NOAA or something like that, or, or has, has there been like positive reception? Um, well, there's been some comments. Let's see if I can explain this logically. Because I am in a science department doing a creative work, there has been, I've gotten some interesting looks and doubt about whether or not, I guess what I was doing was acceptable, I suppose. But, um, and even in my project itself, the different themes often mix together. And I had, let me see. The quote there is basically, a lot of what I learned is it's kind of impossible to pick everything, anything out by itself because everything affects everything else around it in some way. Um, I, um, one of the things I talked about recently was climate change, how so much of the little decisions you make can affect that in some way, however small. And it's interesting to see how everything meshes together because it's, it kind of is impossible to pick anything out by itself. I'm not, is that, what you were thinking of? Yeah, yeah, no, I know. Okay. I just appreciate that you are kind of breaking down some of those barriers. Yeah, yeah. The barriers are only for our comfort, comfort mostly. Okay. <coughs> we'll take one last question. And then we'll on. Actually, this was a little bit more of a statement, but I really like what you're doing because I find that sometimes people are not willing to listen to facts or data, but they might still be. Uh, they might be willing to be entertained. And so you're giving a little spoon full of, you know, sugar to get a teensy bit of that medicine down. And so sometimes, you know, people just consume the entertainment, they don't realize they're getting a little bit of that fact and data with it. So then when they make their decisions and look at the world, it's it's incorporating a little bit more of that. So I, I like what you're doing. I think it's great. Thank you. And that's exactly why I'm fascinated by fiction, because it can reach people that might not be reached just by giving them information. <laughs> the, the thing about stories is, I, as I mentioned, they help us feel empathy towards the characters, which can open us up and make us more available to receiving information. So yes, thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Tanner. Next speaker is uh, Dana Huang. Uh, he's a master's student in urban and regional planning department. Uh, Dana's topic is a comparative analysis of the perception of rent control in very low and high income communities in San Jose. A synopsis of her work, uh, San Jose has recently modified their rent control policy, reducing the amount rents can increase every year from 8% to 5%. Uh, despite this recent change, there lacks empirical data on whether residents, homeowners, and renters alike find this policy helpful. Some scholars argue that rent control contributes to higher levels of poverty, while others contend it's a necessary policy to promote income diversity. Data's research looks at extremely low-income residents in the greater Washington neighborhood uh, in San Jose, as well as moderately high-income residents in the Villa Plain neighborhood in San Jose and assesses their attitudes on rent control. So, Dana. Thank you, Shishir. Uh, again, I'm Dana Huang, and um, my presentation is on rent control. To set the stage for you, if we look at the average housing prices in San Jose, it has risen about 12% a year since 2012. In contrast, if we look at the um, median income, it has only increased 6% a year. So there is a disparity between earned income and housing cost in San Jose. So if we look at it specifically in terms of rent control, there are 44,000 units covered under San Jose's rent control policy, and that is out of a total of 120,000 rent control eligible, sorry, rental units. Um, and rent control are units built before 1979, and that is under California's Costa-Hawkins Act, which says multifamily homes, so apartment complexes, and are covered. So duplexes, single-family homes, those are not covered in rent control. So my research sought to see if 
there were differences in attitudes towards the policy between low-income residents in a primarily renter-occupied neighborhood with a high density of rent-controlled units compared to residents in a high-income neighborhood, primarily owner-occupied neighborhood with a low density of rent-controlled units. And I wanted to see if there were similarities between each of the groups of homeowners, renters, and um, between the income categories. And so based on some research, economic data shows that rent control doesn't really work in high income areas um, because it, it, it doesn't, um, market rate units and rent controlled units tend to be about the same. And so my hypothesis was that high income residents would be more suspicious having know, known the data be, um, and thus not really support rent control, whereas low income residents may be more trusting of the policy. The method I used to um, assess the data is I used a door-to-door -door survey, and I surveyed residents in the greater Washington neighborhood and Willow Glen neighborhoods. So about 246 households were surveyed, um, which was about roughly 8% of each of the survey boundaries. And the criteria I used to measure were residents' attitudes about the rent control ordinance, their propensity to relocate, and their community involvement. So these three variables were to see um, the different impacts that rent control had. And so to give you some background on the community de demographics on how disparate these communities are, if we look at the population, Willow Glen has a population of about 3,000 individuals. Well, the greater Washington neighborhood is three times that with a population of about 9,000. And this is the same roughly um, half square mile survey boundary. If we look at the average household size, Willow Glen household is, households are smaller than Greater Washington. If we continue on, if we look at the educational attainment, uh, Willow Glen residents are primarily well educated with a college education, whereas in the Greater Washington neighborhood, most residents have less than a high school diploma. So we see this is, this, there is a disparity in the level of education, which does play into earned income. So if we look at the income, the median household income in Willow Glen is $135,000, which is almost $100,000 more than that of Greater Washington neighborhood. And most surprising to me, if we look at the median net worth, it's $300,000 in Willow Glen compared to $14,000. So if we're looking at individuals' assets and the ability to move and to have um, resources to to purchase a house or to uh, relocate. There is this disparity here. So this map shows all of the rent controlled properties in the greater Washington neighborhood. So as you can see, there's a significant amount and they're pretty, um, pretty evenly spread, spread out around the neighborhood. And so if we look at the criteria uh, from the survey respondents, over 80% of both owners and renters supported a 2% cap. And so this is lower than what San Jose's current policy is at 5%. And interestingly, Greater Washington homeowners were um, in more support of stricter rent caps. Now if we look at the propensity to relocate, renters were more likely to indicate that they would move out of the neighborhood, and yet they said that they would stay in San Jose. So the question asked was, in the next three years, will you move? So it's not, are you thinking of moving or likely to move? This is asking, will you move? Um, and so if we see this, that residents said that they will move out of the neighborhood, but the problem will still remain in San, Ho in San Jose. So there is still this problem of housing that San Jose will need to address. And the homeowners indicated that they will um, stay in the neighborhood. Now if we look at neighborhood participation, um, renters were less involved in the neighborhood. However, if we look at what is most striking, owners, 70% of owners indicated that they participate regularly in a religious or faith-based organization. Um, similarly, there's high participation in PTA meetings and neighborhood association meetings. And this is an important finding to consider, especially when thinking um, from an advocacy perspective on where are the people and what is the best way to, out, to reach them and give them the information. These are the places where you can best uh, communicate to the population. And when asked if residents would accept 
additional rent control policies, um, over 70% of both owners and renters agreed that new apartments should have rent control. And again, um, this is this would contradict the cost of this California's Costa Hawkins Act, which says that new units cannot have rent control. So this would uh, lead to repealing that. Now, if we look at the Willow Glen survey boundaries, we can see that there are less rent controlled units than that of the similar um, surveyed area of the greater Washington neighborhood. And most of the rent controlled units are along um, the Willow Street boundary right here and Minnesota Avenue, so the main arterials in the neighborhood. If we look at Willow Glen residents' response to the um, criteria, renters more likely indicated that they would support a 2% rent cap, whereas homeowners indicated um, that they would support, more likely support a 5% rent cap, which is what San Jose's current rent cap is. And so um, home, homeowners in Willow Glen still supported rent control, but um, not as great as in homeowners in the greater Washington neighborhood. Now, if we look at propensity to relocate renters, again, the larger proportion indicated that they would move out of the neighborhood um, and that they would move out of San Jose. And most interestingly to me is that 43% um, of owners said that they would move out of San Jose. Now this is interesting because this is the wealthy, highly educated neighborhood. And so if they're saying that they're going to move out of San Jose, then that um, is significant. And so with some of my interviews with housing experts, they um, explain that it could potentially be because they have the wealth and they have the income to um, move elsewhere and they're not limited. Um, if you know their dollar can go further elsewhere and they can buy a bigger house. If we look at neighborhood participation, it was actually significantly lower than in the greater Washington neighborhood, which surprised me because we the common assumption is that wealthy residents are um, involved in their neighborhoods. But again, there is a lot of participation in religious faith organizations, PTA groups, and the neighborhood association, especially among owners. And if we look at additional rent control policies, again, more than half of residents agreed that newly built apartments should have rent control and that the government should do more to protect renters. So we look at this, the most salient findings are that, um, that residents indicated that they will move, especially in Willow Glen, which I think is, from a policy perspective, is really significant to consider um, where, where, what the migration patterns of uh, individuals are. Similarly, from an advocacy perspective, the best way to reach individuals are in religious and faith-based organizations. So if you want to target, if you want to get people to go to those council meetings or to, to make sure a, a diverse populace of voices are heard, those are the, uh, these are the best places to go. Um, similarly, um, there was widespread support of lowering the rent cap to 2%, so from the 5% of what it is now to 2%. And that was 70% of everyone surveyed agreed to that. And then 70% um, of all respondents agreed that newly built apartments should be covered under rent control. So if we look at the policy implications of this, this would require repealing the state policy, the Costa Hawkins Act, um, because as, as time goes on, the buildings will continue to decay that are covered and be demolished. And so those 44,000 units covered under rent control will only further dwindle. And San Jose can do more to enforce rent control laws. San Jose really, they don't have a rent control police going around knocking on doors, making sure landlords aren't raising rent more than 5% a year. And so that's another way that San Jose can do a better job of enforcement and having more teeth in the policy to reprimand um, landlords. Uh, there is support across all income categories. And in talking to the housing director of San Jose, she didn't realize that homeowners were interested in the policy. And so this could um, be, a, there could be a possibility for putting this on the ballot and getting a two thirds majority for um, the policy. So are there any questions or comments?
I, that was a terrific study. That was, that was really smart and really well done. And I think probably many of us in the room were surprised that the support was so high in the book. I think we were expecting much lower numbers than you know, it was lower by comparison, but overall, that was surprising. Um, I wonder, because the attitudes towards things like rent control and other sort of measures to safety net measures for low income people are often tangled up in people's pathological behavior uh, or sort of perceptions of the poor. Mm -hmm. Did you include in your survey anything like that sort of attitudes towards the poor or something like this that would appear an indication about why people favored or didn't favor these kinds of, of measures? No, I didn't. So it's just blanket. Like, do you, do you support rent control? And so the residents have the option of saying, no, I don't think it's a good policy. Um, but no, I wasn't. As you, as you administered the survey, did anybody sort of comment, make comments to you that sort of gave you an indication of any of this sort of stuff? So there was actually a really widespread support. A lot of individuals, homeowners, even in Willow Glen, said, oh, this is great. Um, San Jose is so unaffordable, we really need more affordable housing strategies. Um, so there was a lot of support. There wasn't much opposition. Yes, so when I met with um, Jackie, the housing director, she shared that landlords have a disproportional representation in city council meetings. So they're coming with signs saying, my child's education is at stake, and we're not seeing homeowners or renters coming to that. So future research could actually interview and, and have landlords' perceptions to this. Um, perhaps there isn't much disparity, or perhaps there is a large disparity between um, what landlords think, but in those emotional and heated settings, it's really hard to see the difference. Um, so that is one area of expanding it to ask landlords. And I think also um, just getting homeowners into the mix and um, asking what they think. And um, also this, this study only looked at rent control, and so it would be interesting to look at other strategies San Jose is doing, like inclusionary housing or um, Section 8 or others. Just out of curiosity, I don't think that it was in your slides, but I'm just curious, what's the median income for someone to qualify for, to live in a rent control? Anyone. And so that is, yeah, so you can make $200,000 and live in a rent controlled unit, or you can make $15,000. So um, there is no difference. So I, I live in a rent controlled unit. Um, but what the research shows is those who have a higher income, they, they receive the greatest benefit because um, they have the most cost savings. They're, they're saving more each month um, because their rent isn't going up. Whereas a low income person, more of their monthly income is going towards rent. So that just means that they can't, the landlord can't raise above whatever the 5% a year. Yeah. Annually. Annually. So once you get in, um, it's, it's locked at that as the base. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm Jeff's uh, title uh, for research presentation is The Silicon Valley Approach to Poverty, Creating Fairly Loan Active Alternatives with Social Impact Design. So a little bit of synopsis. Since 2012, a small informal collective of Silicon Valley design professionals and social scientists like Fair Money 
has been researching and developing ethical alternatives to risky, high-interest payday loans. Fair many members borrow from their backgrounds in anthropology and commercial product design to understand how payday loans fit into the financial strategies of low-income families in the San Francisco Bay Area. In this presentation, Jeff discusses the challenges, debates, and opportunities within this unique transdisciplinary collaboration and how fair many reflects the growing involvement of the Silicon Valley Bank practitioners in poverty alleviation projects around the globe. I should also add that Jeff is an anthropology uh, student and his mentor, AJ Fass, Professor Fass, is also here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Let's see. Let me know if you can hear if I need to. All right. I'll probably need two hands for this. Oh, so. you do. Oh. Yeah. I'll just talk loud. <laughs> so, Silicon Valley is heralded as the land of innovation and opportunity, but not for everyone. Lower income people are struggling to pay their bills each month with wages that have not kept pace with the rising cost of living. Services like payday loans fill this gap for a financial emergency like needing to fix a car or pay off medical expenses. For a fee, payday lenders will discreetly and conveniently provide small amounts of cash up to about $300, regardless of bad credit. But sometimes the emergency becomes paying rent or buying groceries. At an annual interest rate of over 400%, what seemed like a manageable one-time loan can balloon to many times the original amount borrowed, necessitating one loan to pay off the other, trapping people in debt. For my thesis, I researched Fair Money, a local grassroots collective trying to devise payday loan alternatives. This loosely organized, self-funded group was founded in 2012 in Redwood City and has about eight active members at any given time. It consists mainly of anthropologists and design professionals, uh, the kinds of people who work at Silicon Valley tech firms where they research and build the sorts of apps and uh, online services that you might have used today. I joined Fair Money four years ago. At the time, I was a designer recently out of college, wanting to work towards social change. For my thesis, I am now looking at this group through the lens of anthropology. My research was inspired by anthropologists studying up within more formal humanitarian design contexts and in international aid organizations. Studying up here refers to looking at the people attempting to do good instead of simply studying those they seek to help. I borrowed from their approaches to examining power relationships and the unintended consequences in economic development projects. I set out to answer the following questions. How do designers and anthropologists work together to navigate the ethical and practical challenges of alleviating poverty? And how do values from the Silicon Valley commercial design industry shape the, this uh, humanitarian project? To answer these questions, I conducted individual interviews with members of Fair Money on their motivations for joining and about the personal and organizational challenges they had encountered uh, during this project. I also participated in, observed, and documented monthly Fair Money meetings over the course of six months. I wanted to see how the members interacted as they dis debated goals, analyzed research, and proposed alternatives to payday lending services. Fair Money members gave many reasons for volunteering their time with the group. Most were outraged over predatory lending practices in the financial services industry, particularly in the wake of the Great Recession. Others had first-hand experience growing up with little money or living on a minimum wage. When asked about the value of design practices in addressing humanitarian issues, many designers responded that they had seen the power of ethnographic research to sway decision makers and drive innovative solutions uh, in corporate settings. They wish to bring those research and design skills to fair money. In order to develop their alternatives to payday lending, Fair followed a human-centered design approach grounded in ethnographic research, an approach common to product development in Silicon Valley design firms. They began by interviewing payday loan recipients on what it takes to make ends meet on modest incomes in Silicon Valley, then having them diagram and create diaries of their spending over the course of a month. They found that their participants were often very adept at managing the little money they have, and that payday loans can be part of a rational strategy when there are few alternatives. 
this volunteer collaboration moves at a pretty slow pace, uh, with activities stretching across months and even years. FAIR has faced difficulties moving from collecting the stories of payday loan recipients to proposing specific alternatives or to reaching out to potential partners. This pace frustrates more solution-oriented members of the group. Uh, those people are used to the narrowly defined problems and tight timelines and concrete deliverables of commercial design practice. On the other hand, research-oriented members, typically those with training in anthropology, see this pace as a virtue. They're worried that rushing to propose interventions without conducting extensive research could continue the spread of superficial solutions that do little to address the root causes of financial hardship. Fair members are aware of other groups in Silicon Valley with similar aims. Activists are working to regulate payday loan shops, while banks, philanthropic organizations, and tech firms are developing financial literacy courses and money management apps that you can see here. These are meant to help people avoid taking out petty loans in the first place. But privately and in meetings, FAIR members express their frustration with these solutions for failing to recognize that sometimes there simply isn't enough money to manage and that many people living in poverty already have effective strategies for making every dollar count. When I began my observations, FAIR was in the midst of reconsidering its goals. Members had come to realize they needed to change their definition of designing for good while there is some interest still in developing petty loan alternatives, the group has begun to shift towards laying the groundwork for more systemic change through storytelling. Showing how their participants are in many ways good with money could change public perceptions about how lower income people manage their money and also open the door to solutions that put more money into the pockets of people who need it the most, such as affordable housing, fair wages, or mending our frayed social safety net. They do this via public engagement events and by sharing their findings with peers in the design industry. So whether or not fair money achieves its goals, nearly every member commented on the sense of community each time they gather around a kitchen table with their friends and colleagues for a monthly meeting of the collective. Fair Money brings together a group that ranges from students to experienced professionals with backgrounds in anthropology and design, academia and industry, all with the common goal of helping people experiencing poverty in Silicon Valley. Through their transdisciplinary collaboration, members of the collective debate ethical issues like how to minimize power differentials with low-income interviewees. They also share effective storytelling techniques, research methods, and provide insights from professional experience. Fair Money is a grassroots manifestation of a growing social impact design movement. Silicon Valley design consultancies like IDEO.org are increasingly partnering with organizations like the Gates Foundation, the World Bank, and major financial institutions in order to bring affordable, accessible financial services to tradi traditionally underserved communities locally and globally. They claim services like micro-lending, cell phone-enabled cash transfers, and financial literacy programs can help families build economic resilience and lift themselves out of poverty. For the sake of time, I won't detail it here, but I also conducted interviews with designers working on these larger scale social impact design projects as a complement to my work with Fair Money. Like with Fair Money, these projects borrow approaches from anthropology and commercial product design. Some anthropologists and development scholars have critiqued social, social impact design efforts for fetishizing technological solutions and for shifting the bur burden of societal issues onto individuals. In spite of this, many of these scholars are cautiously optimistic about the future of social impact design. They believe that if practiced reflexively, social impact designers hold the potential to drive the development industry into more humanistic and locally relevant directions. My research with Fair Money sheds light on some of the challenges and opportunities in these interdisciplinary social impact design collaborations. It also shows how my fields can work together to create ethical impact. Designers can urge anthropologists to move from research to proposing solutions while helping them reach broader audiences and influence powerful institutions. Anthropologists, on the other hand, can temper the design industry's headlong rush towards developing solutions for poverty by providing cultural context. They can also help designers work ethically with vulnerable populations and study the historical or institutional factors that perpetuate inequality and poverty. It's imperative 
that social impact designers and anthropologists collaborate and learn from one another, lest we end up with more superficial solutions that do little to address the real needs of people experiencing poverty. Thank you, and thank you to my committee uh, and my department. So. precedents for other kinds of interdisciplinary informal working groups that have created social change because that that's something that is a very established phenomenon that comes out of academia um, where academics grab a beer and talk about things that they wouldn't talk about in the ivory tower and, and have you looked at some of those historic examples in, in shaping your thinking about how you conceive fair money um, so actually, that's been kind of, as I've been analyzing the research, so that's actually started to come into it more and more, this idea of communities of practice. Um, so uh, I'm involved, and um, Dr. Jan here is involved, uh, with a group called the Ethno Breakfast, which is uh, a group that intersects with uh, Fair Money, uh, along with a couple other uh, informal kind of uh, knowledge sharing groups within uh, the communities of design and anthropology, particularly around the um, Silicon Valley tech industry. So um, I'm becoming more and more aware of those, but uh, most of my uh, inspiration for this was, though, from those kind of larger, more formal uh, interactions, so looking at international development. But now, um, as I'm starting to understand the value of communities of practice um, and the informal engagements, uh, I'm really trying to uh, now see uh, Fair Money in that light. Um, because again, they aren't necessarily commensurate. The types of constraints are, are very different. Um, but it does help to kind of uh, compare and contrast, seeing what one might be able to learn from the other, what, what different scales of these sorts of interaction might be able to learn from one another. Uh, Jeff, I wonder if, for the benefit of everyone here, you could uh, elaborate or contextualize a little bit the fact that your study is a, a sort of hyper-focused ethnographic case in what is a broader and very enduring problem of doing good badly, right? Um, and in humanitarian work around the world. And, and so I wonder if you could, again, for the benefit of the rest of us here, just um, elaborate for a moment on that, sort of how your project is an intervention into this broader. Um, so I actually was inspired by, uh, I guess seeing the failures, like I'm fascinated by failure. Um, actually, uh, AJ Foss uh, and I uh, connected initially uh, on a book called Seeing Like a State, Why Certain Initiatives to Improve the Human Condition Have Failed. And uh, what struck me was that those were often projects that were led by engineers and designers, the kinds of people that I went to school with and I work with on a daily basis, who have great ideas um, but might uh, not exactly fully understand the program, or project, uh, or the, the cultural context, or uh, try to take something in a kind of cookie cutter fashion that might work okay in a uh, certain Western context, but um, maybe not so uh, applicable to uh, somewhere in Tanzania, um, as is one of the examples in the books holds. Um, so that's again why, why I was looking at this uh, international development, um, seeing that we've got this long history of dumping billions of dollars, possibly trillions, um, yeah, into international development, into trying to alleviate poverty. Um, we, you know, I think the, uh, the war on poverty in America has been declared uh, you know, kind of a failure because we've actually fallen um, quite far behind. So again, it's more about uh, understanding that we haven't achieved our goals. And, and by looking at the sorts of thinking that go on uh, in the organizational level, um, that's the only way it can really uh, achieve change for people who are experiencing poverty. So again, that, that's studying up versus um, studying the community. There's a lot of information about um, you know, what it's like to experience poverty, but um, less about these opaque institutions that kick around the trillions of dollars. So I'm going to 
sorry if I could sneak in. Um, but actually, you, you have another chance. Yet. Um, yeah, so that's, and that's actually a, a big part of the uh, work of Fair Money. We actually have some uh, gender scholars, um, sociologists on board. Um, so yeah, it, it does come up a lot in that report and, uh, but also like, uh, it, it just is a, it's a general factor that, that we're contending with. So um, the idea that uh, you're more likely to end up in poverty um, or end up uh, on, homeless if you have children um, and are a single mother. Like we definitely uh, noticed that in the Fair Money collaboration. And again, I go I go back and forth because again, I have one foot as a member of the Fair Money Collective and another one um, researching the organization. So, um, so yeah, definitely it is something we're looking at. So this is really interesting to me, this sort of interplay. Um, and, and I guess I was wondering about, uh, you said that you had interviewed five people uh, within this group. Um, and, but I was wondering also about the flux. And were you seeing uh, movement during the time period you were there? And did you see any character, just your own personal observations, um, those who perhaps wanted to see things move faster and then therefore left, or those who wanted to spend more time and therefore left? Yeah, um, so uh, part of this actually came out um, from some of the people who had been involved with the group for longer and um, were talking, talking about when it initially was founded that there were a lot more people from the design industry who, who had backgrounds purely in design, not so much in uh, uh, ethnographic research. Uh, so a lot of those people had actually initially left um, pretty quickly on once they realized that this was kind of starting to lean towards um, a social science project. Um, but uh, what had happened recently is that uh, we've also had an influx of sociologists um, who have started to uh, also in inject their own flavor into what was largely uh, an anthropologically um, driven group. So um, there have been transitions over time um, and, and there has been some flux um, towards this more um, research and storytelling orientation. Thank you. I know at least there was one person made a question, but let's wait to the end and then we have a few more minutes. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our next presenter is uh, Bill Chapin, a uh, master's student in the urban planning, urban and regional planning department. Uh, and his mentor is uh, Professor Asha Agarwal. Uh, oh, we have Diana Salazar here from urban planning to support. <laughs> Uh, so, Bill's uh, presentation title is Parking Spaces to Living Spaces, Reform and Housing Affordability in Central San Francisco. The synopsis is as follows. As the Bay Area continues to grapple with housing crisis, a growing body of urban planning research suggests that long accepted parking policy is part of the problem. By mandating excessive parking, zoning codes increase construction costs and reduce urban density. So what happens when cities hate the critics and start to allow reduced parking? This presentation takes advantage of San Francisco's incremental approach to reform and analyzes an area that for nearly seven years experienced notable residential development under two different set of parking standards. So one the more liberal parking and the one more constrained parking. So let's see what Bill has to say about that. All right, thank you. Thank you. Who is, Who is ready, to ready to talk about, about the fascinating, fascinating world, world of parking, parking regulation? regulation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so uh, <clears throat> minimum, minimum parking, parking requirements, requirements, they, they are, are found in nearly in every city's zoning code uh, across the country. Um, and as the name implies, they basically they define a minimum number of parking spaces that have to be included with any new development. So, for example, in San Francisco, for a long time, the standard was one parking space for each dwelling unit. Uh, however, that began to change about a decade ago. Uh, so with that in mind, my study looked at a specific area of central Fran San Francisco and asked whether the changes being made to the parking standards resulted in differences to four things. Uh, the actual number of parking spaces that were offered, uh, the housing density measured in the number of units per acre, 
uh, the prevalence of uh, affordable, so subsidized, below market rate uh, units, and then just the uh, straight up construction costs. So why should we care about how zoning regulates parking? For one thing, minimum parking requirements make housing more expensive. And to illustrate this, imagine for a moment that you are a developer, you've got a plot of land, and you want to put a 50 unit apartment building on it. Uh, minimum parking requirements will do one of two things. They will either limit the amount of apartments that you can fit on the space, or they can vastly increase your uh, construction costs. And either way, uh, the uh, expenses per unit are going to go up. So this is just one of the criticisms that has been lobbed against the practice of minimum parking requirements. Uh, and cities have really started to take heed um, between 2005 and 2011, uh, one researcher identified uh, almost 130 uh, cities that had gotten rid of their requirements, mostly in their downtown areas. Um, the urban planning literature is pretty clear on all the bad things that happen when you implement minimum parking requirements, but as cities have started to repeal them in the last decade, uh, the question is what happens when you get rid of them, and there has not been a lot of research on that uh, so far. I was only able to identify two studies that looked at it from the perspective of housing uh, costs. So uh, if parking reform can, in fact, um, stimulate more affordable housing, that could be a really important tool, especially in the Bay Area, where, as we've heard in the last uh, couple uh, presentations, there's uh, major problems with uh, housing affordability. Um, the, uh, the latest numbers right, are in San Francisco. Uh, more than 20% of renters are spending at least half of their income on rent. So San Francisco is actually one of those uh, 130 cities that uh, has uh, reformed its approach to parking. But rather than adopting one standard across the entire city, uh, they went neighborhood by neighborhood. And this being San Francisco, some of those neighborhood plans took a long time to actually get passed. Uh, and so what you had were uh, some situations where there were parcels that were maybe in relatively close proximity to each other, uh, but they uh, were subject to different parking standards for years at a time. Uh, so my study took advantage of one such situation. Uh, I focused in on development along uh, Van Ness Boulevard, which is right here, and then Market Street, uh, in central San Francisco. So the study area there, that encompasses two different uh, official city planning districts. One of them is the Market and Octavia plan area, that's the blue uh, here, and then the other is the Van Ness Special Use District, that's the green here. Um, so uh, these are both uh, mixed use, moderately dense and transit accessible neighborhoods, both of which had been targeted for new housing development. Uh, the difference is that Market and Octavia since 2008 had really been zoned specifically to encourage development that had reduced parking, whereas Van Ness continued under the city's old system up until 2014. So I used uh, several um, official San Francisco uh, documents and databases along with GIS mapping software to identify all of the housing developments that had at least 10 units that had been, uh, that were within the study area and had been approved by the San Francisco Planning Commission between two specific dates that were determined based on uh, when the zoning changes took place. Uh, I then calculated variables representing each of the four parts of the study question uh, and then determined whether these developments, whether or not they were subject to minimum parking requirements at the time of their approval and then compared each of the variables using a t-test. Um, using this, uh, I found 44 developments uh, within the study area that met the requirements. Um, and uh, 30 of them had no minimum parking requirement, 14 of them had the one-to-one -one requirement. And these are just a few of the examples. They include everything. Uh, 1688 Pine Street here is a new, uh, pretty standard uh, luxury development with underground parking. Uh, but you also have, I think my favorite is 149th Street over here, which uh, was an old furniture shop that a group of artists wanted to change into a live workspace. Uh, and they had to get a variance from their parking requirement because otherwise these artists would have had to figure out somehow how to put 10 parking spaces underneath uh, this building. <laughs> um, 
which they didn't have the money to do. Um, so the results, uh, all four of the variables ended up uh, having a uh, statistically significant finding. And I'm going to go through each of them. Um, the, uh, the most robust of the results uh, was the actual number of parking uh, spaces. So developments that had a minimum requirement did have more parking, about 90 spaces for every 100 units. Um, if uh, that level of parking had been found throughout the study area, that would have meant 1,600 more parking spaces uh, in this part of the city, taking up about a half million square feet. Um, along the same uh, idea, so, um, developments that were not subject to a minimum requirement were able to fit about 100 more dwelling units uh, per acre of land. Um, and if that had not been the case, it would have meant a 27% reduction in the number of housing units in this part of the city. Uh, however, you can see from the plot that there's not really a clear trend in the data, and my suspicion is that there's an interaction going on here with one of the other aspects of the zoning code, which is height uh, limitations. So um, basically, as far as density goes, it should be taken with a grain of salt. Um, <clears throat> turning to affordable housing uh, in general, so market rate developments, they tended to just put in the minimum number of subsidized units that was required by the city. So that's all this that's clustered down here. The interesting thing is that there were five developments that had 100% uh, affordable units. That's these five uh, points right here. All five of those were in parts of the city that did not have minimum parking requirements. And so that boosted the percentage in the no minimum zones to 23%. Um, and so without that, so if only 6% of the housing uh, was affordable throughout the study area, it would have meant 600 fewer subsidized units in just this part of the city. And that would have been a 73% reduction in the number of subsidized units. Uh, and then finally, uh, looking at um, the construction costs, buildings with a one-to-one -one parking requirement, on average, it costs about $100,000 more. Uh, they're more expensive to build. That translates, when you try to translate that into what that means for rent, that's about $800 uh, per month in rent. And that's really the difference between housing that is affordable versus housing that's not affordable. So a two-person household that's making San Francisco's median uh, income, they might be able to manage $1,900 a month in rent, but $2,700 a month in rent, they are not going to be able to do it. It's going to be a burden on them. Uh, in addition, uh, I also interviewed six developers who are active in this uh, area of San Francisco. In general, uh, they said that parking does exert a substantial influence on their designs. Uh, those who had built in areas that had minimum or uh, that had no minimum requirements, often they were unsure of what they would have done if the city had still required them to build one parking space per unit. And in many cases, they said that the development might not have gone forward at all. Uh, and, finally, and finally, they described parking as a complex decision that uh, depended on multiple factors of which the zoning code is just one consideration. So uh, in conclusion, the findings here, they're largely consistent with the existing research on parking. They give us a glimpse into what this part of San Francisco might have looked like if the old parking requirements had remained in place. So it would have meant more space for parking, less space for housing, fewer subsidized units, and uh, more expensive rents and sale prices. And based on these findings and that of other researchers, I would recommend that every city uh, needs to take a look at their parking policy and ask if it's getting in the way of their housing goals. Uh, and especially here in the Bay Area, uh, any city that's still requiring a minimum number of parking spaces for something that's being built across the street from a BART station or a Caltrain station, which does exist uh, here, uh, they, uh, they really need to step back and ask, ask themselves why. So thank you very much. So um, 
the so it, within the study area here, one of the reasons I limited it to uh, I believe it was 2,000 feet of both Market Street and Van Ness was to make sure that everything was within uh, a walkable distance of high frequency transit. Um, <clears throat> as far as what what the planning research larger says. Um, the basic takeaway that I got from looking at all this is that if you give people free parking, they are going to drive regardless of whether there is a train, <laughs> uh, a train station uh, a block from their house. Uh, so if they have plentiful free parking at their apartment and plentiful free parking at their office, then they're going to they're going to drive. Um, so I thought I could, I um, understood. I was, I'm living this project just because I live in a neighborhood where it's very hard to find parking. And having like two kids, having to uh, walk like two blocks just to find my car, like it's a burden. So I'm wondering, um, like if you um, kind of like came across strategies, people uh, come across to like claim parking. I know my son, they use the bins or like the cars, like. It's all, they're all over the place and almost like, you know, sidewalks, this and that. So I'm wondering if you can have like a personal or just found that strategy. Right. Uh, so there's the, there's the distinction, right, between on-street parking, uh, which is a public good, uh, versus off-street parking, which is a private good, but that through public regulation like this, the uh, developers are required to provide. And a lot of the political resistance to um, <clears throat> to changing the zoning laws uh, to take away this regulation tends to come from people who live in neighborhoods where uh, there's a, already a limited amount of uh, of on-street parking, um, and. The the other thing I would caution it right is that uh, while I do think that every city should look at the interaction between their parking and their housing policies, uh, there's no one size fits all uh, solution. It's going to vary from city to city and from neighborhood to neighborhood, um, which is one of the reasons I think it's nice that San Francisco uh, did it neighborhood by neighborhood rather than just uh, saying across the board. But um, uh, the uh, there are a couple of uh, solutions that you can uh, have in place if you have a situation where it's a neighborhood that has limited on-street parking. Like you can put in place uh, permitting that uh, lets residents get permits for on-street parking, um, and then that can that can help uh, regulate it. Uh, so th there are some solutions that you can do that. Because you're working with two different systems and you're trying to figure out how to integrate them. So. I'm going to come in. Uh, I was thinking about you, the neighborhoods that you had chosen uh, was because there's high frequency transit in them. Um, but with uh, you know, the adaptation of less parking spaces, is that putting stress on the transit? And does that transit system have the adaptability to um, handle increased population of using it? <laughs> Um, you know, and I didn't, I, I didn't look specifically at uh, SFMTA and uh, <clears throat> and how they, you know, how they were doing. Um, uh, that that's another area for for future research and to really look more into uh, the, that interaction between housing and land use regulation and transportation planning. There's there's so much there and so much more that needs to be uh, needs to be looked into. So uh, so I see this as a as a starting point uh, for that discussion. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's, I, I've read some of the uh, some of the stuff that I've read uh, describes minimum parking requirements less as a transportation issue and more as a de facto way for cities to uh, regulate density. Uh, and so it, because they, they de facto they keep uh, they prevent developers from making development more more dense just like that. So. As the saying goes, last but not the least, we have uh, Rachel Cole from Sociology and Interdisciplinary Social Sciences. Uh, her mentor is Dr. Carlos Garcia. Carlos, uh, so uh, Rachel's uh, topic is challenging the stained glass ceiling, exploring political participation among women in the evangelical church. So a brief synopsis, the, evan the evangelical Christian church is both highly politically mobilized and patriarchal, which prompts this research on how women negotiate political responsibilities and experience political participation as members of, the, of this church. So Rachel's uh, research attempts to answer the role of gender in, a, in evangelical politics by using a mixed methodological approach that utilizes a secondary data analysis of a survey conducted in 2014 by Pew Research Center and through ongoing semi-structured interviews. So let's see what Rachel Hello, again, my name is Rachel Cole of the Sociology Department. Uh, this study is a mixed methodological approach to explore the intersectionality of gender and religion in a political context. Uh, with the time I have here today, I'm gonna to be focusing on my qualitative results. So who are evangelical Christians? It's a distinct sect of Protestant Christianity with a religious landscape of about 28% and a population of 91 million, which translates to uh, about 32 million registered voters. Uh, these four core fundamentals of evangelical Christianity are uh, in line with the National Association of Evangelicals. So it is the belief that the Bible is the ultimate authority, uh, the belief that evangelizing or spreading the Christian gospel is a religious duty, and finally that salvation is gained through the belief in Jesus Christ alone, right? So that separates it from Catholicism where you go into confessional and that's how you receive your salvation. Um, so the evangelical Christian community has a long history of political mobilization and participation uh, known as the Christian right, which began in the 1970s as a response to liberal shifts in American culture, right? We have the emergence of feminism and then uh, gay liberation movements. And the Christian right has a dialectic or mutually influencing relationship with the Republican Party as evident by these presidential exit polls, right? Uh, the most relevant being 81% of evangelical Christians voted for Trump. So these are the literatures in which I engage for this research. Uh, the most relevant being the third, which states that there are um, a civic voluntarism model, which states that you go beyond looking at socioeconomic factors to determine an individual's likelihood of participating in politics, right? So you go beyond education levels or income levels, and this includes resources such as time, money, or civic skills, which are like communication, right? Public speaking, or writing a letter to the representative. Uh, those are civic skills. And as well as recruitment, right? Somebody needs to ask you to engage in politics. And finally, political interest. So to further this, um, lots of research has been done to use the church as a location for developing civic skills. So I conducted a secondary data analysis of a Pew Research Center survey. Um, sorry, within end of 2002, I did an ordinal logistical regression. And my hypothesis was that evangelicalism has a positive effect on voting frequency. So the results show that evangelicalism increases an individual's likelihood of voting, as well as being a woman increases an individual's likelihood of voting when controlling for income, uh, education levels, and political interest. So considering that evangelicals have an intense political mobilization history, as well as the fundamental beliefs of the Bible, uh, this is just extra stuff. How do women in the evangelical church experience political participation? 
So I conducted 10 semi-structured interviews with women who attend churches that are as defined by the National Association of Evangelicals. Some data, but the most important distinctions I make for this research are explicit and covert. So when I say explicit, I mean that the church is explicitly evangelical, that the word evangelical is in the church's name, it can be found on the church's website, or the, the participant explicitly stated, I attend an evangelical church compared to covert, which is not explicit, right? So there are statements of faith located on the website that mirror the fundamentals of evangelical Christianity, or on the website they display partnerships with outside evangelical associations. And then I make a further distinction between progressive and conservative. So these are ideal types distinctions, and I'm not talking about political ideology. So when I say progressive, I mean that there is a presence of a woman on the pastoral team. Not on the ministry team, which is like children's ministry or women's Bible ministry. It is just the pastoral team. So right, who is the pastor or the preacher to the congregation? Uh, conversely, with conservative churches who do not have a woman on the pastoral team. So these are my three themes from my data analysis. To begin with the first one, women pastors and their influence. So. According to a Faith Communities Today 2010 national survey, only 9% of evangelical congregations have the opportunity of listening to a woman pastor. The gender gap of pastors at the evangelical church is a result of their strict gender ideology, where women are prohibited from obtaining positions of power, as that would be contrary to biblical scripture, scripture which states, and I quote, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent, 1 Timothy 2.12. So the pastor is the ultimate position of hierarchy in the church. They have a great deal of influence over the congregation and they make most, most decisions. So what I have found is that women in progressive churches are more likely to be active in formal political participation compared to conservative churches. So when I say formal political participation, I mean that they are acting upon political ideas such as lobbying, protesting, uh, right, these ideas of acting, voting, of course, um, while informal political participation includes expressing and supporting political ideas, like discussing politics, volunteering, or donating money. So since progressive churches validate women in leadership by having women on the pastoral team, it encourages women to enlist in leadership positions themselves, which results in gaining civic skills that are needed for formal political participation, as demonstrated by this quote. If you don't reflect the thought that you value women in church leadership, and because that's such, a scene is such an epitome of what you should value, then women naturally don't necessarily find themselves valued or encouraged to seek civic leadership. In contrast, conservative churches do not validate women in leadership, which discourages women to enlist in leadership positions, which results in a lack of civic skills gained, gained needed to participate in formal political participation. Not a lot. My husband is more because the pastor invites him to weekly staff meetings on Mondays. I'm good friends with the pastor's wife, and so every now and then she might ask for my input on something. I'm not super political, but I think another part of it is not necessarily knowing how to be more political. Right, so we have this progressive quote versus a conservative quote, and I think it's a great illustration to discuss the two. So for my next theme, it is gender-specific political issues and arenas. So what are evangelical women politically interested in and where are they politically active in? So the notion that the personal is political applies to women in the evangelical church. Although women exercise their autonomy by participating in politics, they do so only to an extent as political issues are swayed by the church. The evangelical church enables women to participate in gender-specific politics because it is the area in life in which women are permitted experiential authority. So in other words, women in the evangelical church choose to be interested in and act upon political issues that are perceived to be the, by the church to be women's issues, such as abortion and matters relating to education. Therefore, to men and women in the church, it is acceptable for women to be politically interested in and active in women's issues so, so long as they adhere to biblical scripture. The things that supposedly are women's best interests or children's best interests are things that they are naturally allowed to do. Those are the things they gravitate towards. So out of my sample, most of them were women, or I'm sorry, most of them were mothers, and most of them were employed in the educational workforce. So it legitimizes their interests to be politically active or politically discussing these, these topics. 
right? So none of them talked about economics or foreign policy or guns. They're very gendered specific. So to discuss the gender specific arenas, both progressive and conservative women are engaging in informal political participation, mostly through social media. I have found Facebook to be a venue for that political participation. It has given me an opportunity to take stands on issues that a few years ago I would have just kept to myself. So the internet serves as a, a source of connecting with evangelical communities without demanding extensive amounts of free time, which is a resource needed for political participation that women tend to lack compared to men. So this complicates scholarly claims that the evangelical church is an institution that directly fosters formal political participation, as it ignores the strict gender structures within conservative churches that lead women to participate in politics informally, so on the internet. All of the women in the church express that the Bible serves as a socializing agent, since it provides numerous passages that demonstrate what it means to be a woman, including, and I quote, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, Ephesians 5.22. So biblical gender roles are primarily pra practiced in the church and in the home, though most of the women agree that outside of these Christian institutions, uh, biblical gender roles are capable of being manipulated, which is why there are women in the workforce or women in politics. According to my sample, being a woman does not hold women of the evangelical church back from participating in politics. This surprised me as evangelical women have strict gender roles and politics is more often than not seen as a man's game. So political participation is one of the few approaches for women in the church to express their opinions in a manner that is respected by the church. The church permits women participating in politics not only because it furthers the church's political agendas, if it has any, but because it is separated from evangelical notions of gender roles that are persistent and ever present in the church and in the home. It's almost like women could do that, but they can't do it in the church. Like, go be political because that's not the church, so you can go speak out there. But when you're in a church, there are special rules and in the home. So for women in the conservative church, gender roles are accepted and in the church and in the home while they are sometimes, but not often, challenged through informal political participation, such as the internet. For women in the progressive church, gender roles are challenged in the church and in the home while they are further challenged through formal political participation. In either case, women of the church are challenging the notion that women should take the passenger seat on matters outside of domestic life. So my conclusions and implications for future research. So the evangelical church serves as an interesting area of inquiry to review the intersectionality of religion and gender in the context of political participation due to its conflicting political um, ideologies and gender ideologies, specifically for women. Suggestions for future research include enlarging my sample, particularly among the Bible Belt of America. This would allow for a more representative sample of evangelical perspectives as it would further develop the experiences of women on the most conservative side of the spectrum. So based on these preliminary findings, it seems that women who attend evangelical churches in the Bay Area of California, even those without female pastors, are on the liberal side of the evangelical spectrum. It also seems that women among the Bible Belt, unlike women here, participate in politics at lower rates because they are more inclined to experience internal conflicts regarding their gender ideology. Thank you. I think it would definitely be the latter of your two um, circumstances, um, definitely, because it's hard to say because I'm not doing a survey, so I can't say these are, you know, 100%, but based on my interpretation, I think it is significantly related that when I looked at 
how women are experiencing politics who go to progressive churches, they're interested in lobbying, they're writing congressional bills, they're doing very formal activities, whereas the women who attend churches without female pastors are very much like, yeah, I'll post an occasional political idea on Facebook or I'll like this page. It's very, very different. So, and that's, to me, would be one of the reasons to explain those differences. My pleasure. So I'm curious, I know your sample size was pretty small, mm -hmm. um, and you touched on this um, when you talked about your quantitative data, mm -hmm. um, but did you look to see if there are other um, confounding variables, like was what were the demographics, were they all um, white women or so what were the income ranges? I didn't discuss income, um, it was mostly, you know, their race or, you know, their gender, obviously, women. Um, so I really tried to stay away from that. Um, so eight were white, two, one was Mexican-American, and one identified as Caribbean Latina. Um, but you, you would think from the Bay Area there would be a plethora of racial demographics, but that didn't seem to be the case with my sample. But. And then how did you determine um, what churches you were going to get? Uh, just through existing personal connections and snowball sampling. Yeah, it could be a multitude of reasons, everything from misogyny to racism. Um, it could be a lot. Um, I didn't talk to my sample about the race issue. I wanted to keep it more gender oriented. Um, and I never asked them, did you vote for Trump, right? That's not my part of my research. I just wanted to understand how they experience political participation. Um, but you get some little pieces and hints through asking those types of questions and um, I feel personally that most of them were on the Trump side, regardless of progressive or conservative church. It's surprising though that all the other Republican presidents were less than mm -hmm. And that's kind of amazing. Trump, viewing his uh, moral deficiencies in right. his history of life, right. that they would go for it. Right, that's a, a big topic right now in religious scholarship uh, to explain the Trump election because Bush was an evangelical Christian himself, um, but yet you see that a higher demographic rate of evangelicals voted for Trump compared to previous ones. So I don't know if that's because more evangelicals are continuing to mobilize themselves and vote and register to vote and all that kind of, I'm not too sure. Um, I'm still confused. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, I just I want to say, say, man, do I love social sciences. I mean, what an amazing array of talks. We saw everything from fiction about protecting the environment to the other extreme, Trump. And no, I'm just oh. But I mean, it really was amazing. And it shows how social sciences touch every aspect of, of the human experience. Um, and I, I want to extend a thank you to all of our speakers today. If you could clap one more time. I also, of course, want to thank Shashir for all his work putting this together. And I also want to recognize uh, the uh, Dean's Office staff. I see Christy is still here. Delmi was here earlier. Alan. Uh, for the 
And then finally, thank you all for spending the uh, midday with us today, and I hope to see you in the fall for the Dean's Symposium when we have our faculty present. All right. Thank you. For uh, thank yous to the video and, uh, and the photograph staff, so thank you so much. And also the risk advisory committee for selecting the uh, the presentation and also providing detailed feedback. So I like to uh, thank them too. And finally, you all, thank you for coming.